no bystander at Calvary could deny the events at the foot of the cross yesterday. And my guilt bleeds over the thought that Rome has made a grave mistake and killed an innocent man to keep the peace of a religious people. I was given orders for Jerusalem. It was the Passover. A major Roman headache where the city is packed with devout Jews. By the end of their holy week, heaps of lambs are sacrificed. The Jews, they're waiting their Messiah. And I am here to be on guard against him. See, Herod fears losing his throne to this son of David. And we were sent to do his dirty work, to silence those who might claim to know or be the Christ. This year, one name surfaced above the rest. There are always rumors, and they always lead to dead-end roads. But when I first heard of Jesus from a fellow centurion who claimed that his servant was healed after he met Jesus on the road, I knew that we were in trouble. Four days. <laughs> Four days was all it took for a parade to turn into an angry mob. My men and I watched from a distance as Jesus entered Jerusalem. He rode on a lowly donkey. Well, there was no need to make a hasty arrest. After all, he was the picture of weakness. But I have to admit, it was a little unnerving when the people started to shout, Hosanna! My hands strayed to my sword for an extra measure of security should we need it. But we never did. As betrayal would have it, one of Jesus' own followers turned him in. See, Jews can't arrest without Rome's authority. So I would detail with a group of my men to lead these religious hypocrites on a trek across town to a grove of olive trees outside of the city. By torchlight, it was peaceful. Judas said that Jesus often came there to pray, and I can see why. Because it was quiet, away from the hustle and the bustle of the city. When I saw Jesus, it looked like he had surfaced from some internal war. Blood dotted his brow like sweat on a summer day. His jaw was set, but his eyes cried, not my will, but thine. He was a common man without any charisma or the religious show that you see in so many of the Pharisees. I saw a threat to Herod, not in strength, but in truth and authenticity. It's the only reason I continued with the arrest. I have chased and I have pursued and half killed a criminal in trying to bring him to arrest, but I have never had a guilty man approach me and blatantly asked me who I was looking for. Jesus did. My answer was stupid, but his was supernatural. My men and I were catapulted to the ground when Jesus answered in three words, I am he. An unseen force reduced the pride of Rome's army to a display like a boy's toy soldiers. Scattered to the ground, my men and I picked ourselves up, not knowing what to expect next. The usual flurry accompanied the arrest, the chilling kiss, resistance, drawn swords, a severed ear. I expected more, but I fulfilled my orders. I held Jesus fast. But looking back, I can see that he held me. Any man who can throw me to the ground without lifting a finger can surely break my strongest grip. I will never forget Gethsemane. This garden has witnessed miracles. But the chief one being that Jesus moved me in a way that was never possible before. He not only moved me physically, he moved me spiritually. Spiritually. 
I will never forget his eyes. They bore into my soul and exposed me for who I truly am, a murderer at heart. Of all the sacrifices I have seen this week, Jesus' blood covers them all, red as crimson. It mirrors the blood of the lambs that continues to drip into the basins outside the temple. It seems related somehow, as if something is written in red. But try as I might, I just can't figure it out.
His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. The nails that held him set me free. had endured six trials and countless questions. What began as a midnight arrest proceeded into a dead of night inquisition with an early morning audience for the Sanhedrin. Looking back, it's not what Jesus said that was impressive. It's what he didn't say. His silence was deafening. A stark difference between the many words the religious leaders were throwing around. Jesus answered not a word. Instead, he kept his peace, even when he was taunted. But then I realized that Jesus was waiting. See, in the most pivotal point, to the most crucial question, Jesus claimed and said something that no man would dare to say. Bold face, he defied the religious council and claimed to be the Son of God. Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. Herod and Pilate, they all said the same thing. Guilty. The crucifixion was expedited. And as Pilate washed his hands of the task, I was readying mine. But still there was something wrong. Herod sensed it. And Pilate's wife had dreamt it and begged him not to crucify such a just man. But when the crowd began to scream for Barabbas, a murderer and a robber, to be released, 
Pilate, fearing a revolt, was spurred to hasty action. It's the duty of a centurion to prepare a criminal for crucifixion by torture. My men and I mocked and scourged with abandon, yet Jesus withstood the pain. Somebody found a purple robe while another wove a crown of thorns for the king of the Jews to wear. We bowed. We did our best to humiliate him. But looking back, I'm the one who cringes in remorse. When we arrived outside the city, somebody handed me a mallet. It felt like lead in my grip. I handed it off for someone else to do the honors. And that's when Jesus looked at me. Most criminals will spit and curse us as we secure them to their crosses. But Jesus' gaze was merciful and forgiving. Jesus knew that he was innocent. And in that moment, I did too. But there was no way to stop it. The cross was raised, and the most crucial point of suffering and suffocation had begun. While Jesus was on the cross, he didn't call for his angels. He didn't proclaim his innocence. He pleaded with his father. He spoke softly, and I strained to hear him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I thought I knew what I was doing, collecting a day's pay for a hard day's work. My unbelief told me that I was innocent, that my hands were tied almost as much as Jesus's were. But now I see that my guilt has nailed me to a cross of my own. I carry it on my back every day, just as Jesus had to carry his up the road to Calvary. It's a load of filthy acts that I've committed. Evil thoughts, dirty words, selfish deeds. Jesus' cross was grief. Mine is what he calls sin. Jesus was on the brink of dying, but I felt like hell was going to swallow me whole. My heart leapt in my throat when I heard Jesus mention that there was a place for those who were forgiven. He even assured the thief on the cross next to him that the very day he would be with him in paradise. I know I have disqualified myself from such a place. For who can forgive the man who beat the Christ? Calvary fell into darkness as the sun went out. Jesus gave up his own spirit a few hours after being crucified. His final cry and a spear thrust into his side determined that it was finished. The result was that the earth split in two. Lightning illuminated the dark sky, and the grave opened its dead. The events at Calvary proved that surely this man was the Son of God. Children flocked to centurions to hear our stories. Young boys in homemade helmets and wooden swords sit on our knees and beg for just one more tale. But my role in Jesus' crucifixion is not one for the nursery. It is a most gruesome execution, made so much worse by such a willing victim. A man who lays down his life for his people has more than meets the eye. And a battle rages in my heart because of it. I am a prisoner of my own sin. I am guilty of killing Jesus. And I stand condemned in God's eyes.
There's a line that's been drawn through the ages. On that line stands the old rugged cross. On that cross the battle is raging for the gain of man's soul or its loss. On one side march the forces of evil, all the demons and devils of hell. On the other, the angels of glory, and they meet on Golgotha's hill. The earth shakes with the force of the conflict and the sun refuses to shine for there hangs God's son in the balance and then through the darkness he
this wonderful news. This wonderful news has two opposite reactions. How you receive Jesus depends on who you believe him to be. Is he an inconvenience to be put away, to be forgotten? Or is he the son of God with all power? I choose to believe the latter. While Jesus was in the tomb, I doubted his forgiveness. It wasn't until I recalled his words on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do, that I realized I had been forgiven already. Jesus nailed the, the sins of the world to his cross. All I had to do was accept it. We must all come to Calvary at one point in our lives. There, a decision is made when we are confronted with the sins that we have committed in light of the perfection of Christ. Today I visited the cross after returning from the tomb. I traced its crimson journey again, recalling all that Jesus suffered. The difference this time is that I praised him as my savior. I bowed at the foot of the cross. I asked forgiveness of my sins. I placed myself under his rule and authority and arose claiming allegiance to God. I finally know why Jesus had to die. I know what is finished the path for salvation, the way for man to be reconciled to God. I'm not sorry for the part I played in Jesus' death anymore because I see that God used a sinner such as I to make a way for complete forgiveness. I am living proof that God can reclaim any life and make us trophies of his grace. When I look back on the darkness that surrounded my heart just a couple days ago, I rejoice to see the light that Jesus' resurrection has shed over all Jerusalem. He is victor, even when all hope seems lost. You know, sometimes we just have to wait because it's in the deepest dark of night that morning shines the brightest.
We're just about finished with our presentation here. As you heard from Justice, a man who was able to view what they did to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are here today maybe with your preconceived idea of who Jesus Christ was or perhaps is. I would ask you to participate with me if I just ask you a question or two. How many believe, based on what the scriptures say, that we are all sinners? Would you agree with me that we are all sinners? Well, good. The majority of you are correct. Sin means to miss the mark. God's intention was for us not to miss the mark. But as people who are born in sin, we are imperfect. We can never be like God. He knew that. And Jesus Christ had to come to this earth to pay my sin debt, to pay your sin debt. When he did that, it didn't automatically make us children of God. He then gives us the opportunity, when you hear the message of the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, if Jesus just stayed dead, we would have any other religion that's around the world. But he proved that he was God by rising from the dead. Over 500 people saw him at one time after his resurrection. He appeared to his own apostles and many of his followers after the resurrection. The Jews and the Romans were so concerned that Jesus, they would make Jesus out to be some type of uh, tale or the fact that they said he might raise from the dead. They actually put guards in front of the tomb. And yet that did not prevent Jesus from resurrecting from the dead. Those of you in here that were honest enough to say, yes, we are sinners. The next question then is, how many of you say, yes, I have faith? You don't have to raise your hand. But how many of you say, yes, I have faith that Jesus truly is what the Bible tells us he is? He is God in the flesh who died in your place for your sins. If you've already acknowledged that in your life and you've asked Jesus Christ to forgive you for your sins, you have a place in heaven. If this is the first you're hearing of it or if this is the time it finally now resonates in your mind, you could see in this character illustrated how a man comes to the point where he realizes this wasn't just a common man. This was the God-man who died in my place and your place. And if you would like to trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, any day is a good day. But for you right now, this would be a great day. And so what I'd like to do is lead publicly in a prayer. And if you truly believe that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, that he did raise from the dead to prove that he is God, and right now you believe that if you pray to him and ask him to forgive you your sins and ask him to be your savior, that he would do it. The Bible tells us faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We must understand the Bible does declare all men are sinners. And the Bible does declare that Jesus loved you enough to die in your place for your sins. And if you would call on him and you confess him as your personal savior, the moment you do that, you now become a child of God. There's an inheritance waiting in heaven for you. All the blessings that come, apart, uh, come along with being a Christian are given to you at that moment that your belief is realized and you trust Christ as your Savior. So I will pray aloud. I don't know who I'm talking to here this morning. But I would ask if you're sincere and you really believe the things that were stated, that you could call on Christ. It's not my prayer that saves you. It's what you believe about Jesus Christ, that he is God, that he did die for your sins. He's your substitute. You and I cannot die for our own sins. Only God could die to pay our sins, to make us right in the eyes of the Heavenly Father. And if you'll call on him, you too can have your sins forgiven in a home in heaven for eternity. It's a precious gift of Jesus Christ. And so I'll say a few words and stop in this prayer. 
but God knows your heart. I do not. And so if you're willing, you can follow me along in this prayer and pray quietly to yourself. Think about Jesus not only dying on that cross, but coming out of that tomb for your deliverance. And the prayer is just something simple like this. Dear Jesus, I realize that you are God and that you came to this earth to die in my place. Lord, I realize that I cannot get to heaven on my own. I must believe in what you did for me. And at this moment, I'm asking you to forgive me of all my sin and to give me that gift of eternal life. I'm claiming you right now as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and being resurrected from the dead. May you help me now to live a life that would honor you. With their heads bowed and eyes closed.